yesterday, thanks to NGK, my family and I, we got to spend uh, the biggest part of the day, I guess, uh, in Dolly. And um, just before we left to come home, we wanted to eat some funnel cake. You know you can't leave Dolly without eating funnel cake, right? I mean, that's just, that's just it. So, so uh, when Christy walks up and she orders the plain funnel cake, you know, with the powdered sugar, and, uh, hey, you know, that's good enough, but, but I wanted something better. You know? I mean, uh, I, I wanted the funnel cake with whipped cream and Reese's cups and Reese's pieces, you know. And, and so, uh, better things, right? Hey, you know, uh, you know it, right? So, but the writer of Hebrews uh, is still here trying, in chapter 9 today, trying to convince these Jewish Christians not to leave their newfound Christian faith, you know, their faith in Christ, to go back to the Old Covenant. And uh, he's done this so far by pulling out a lot of different things. And the primary argument is well, that Jesus is greater than there. And we spent the biggest part of the first part of the group talking about that. And when he starts out basically by reminding them and us, uh, you know, it's implied to us today that, that Jesus is greater than angels. He's the, in essence, God Himself. He's greater than Moses and Abraham. He's greater than Melchizedek. And uh, we've been in this section where he's really been focusing on how Jesus is greater than the high priest and greater than uh, you know, the, and the greater uh, uh, sacrifices is basically what we're going to look at here today. But, but um, you know, it's really an important topic for these guys because they want to look back and, and they want to go back to the way things were. And uh, usually we, we read all the way through the text right off the bat. We're not going to do that this morning. What I want to do today is just kind of read through the text as we go through. We've got 28 verses, so uh, we're going to read it all, but we're just going to read it as we introduce each part. What I want to do is I want to start out by reading the first 10 verses, all right? Because that's the part that we're going to look at in, in the first point. So let's just read from God's Word, starting in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. God's Word says, Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first, for a tent was prepared for the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of presence, and it's called the holy place. And then behind the second curtain was a second place called the most holy or the Holy of Holies. And in there, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn, holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherub beam of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. And he says, of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes. And he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way in the holy places is not yet open as long as the first section is still standing, which is, is, is symbolic for the present age. And according to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reform reformation. This is the Word of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for Your Word today. God, help us to understand its truth and apply that truth to will convict us of sin and help us to walk like you will help us to live and love like you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me tell you guys something. If you're living your life apart from Christ, or if you're trying to do things your way without considering Jesus, you're missing out on the better things. That's the way most of us try to live our lives. If we get, you know, John Piper, a famous famous uh, pastor from uh, Minnesota, 
he he uh, he calls it uh, Christian atheism in a sense. I think is the term he uses, and that means we say we're Christian. You know, we walk an aisle, maybe we said a prayer, we were baptized, and we go to church. But when we live our lives, we really do that without really considering what God really wants for us. We don't live our lives like we believe in God. We go to church, but other than that, there's nothing. And that's what I'm trying to help you see here this morning because, you know, if you want something better, if you want the better things that Christ has offered, if you want the better relationship with the Lord, if you want to live life to its fullest, You've got to be completely sold out to Christ in every part of your life. And that's where we want to be. Is that where you want to be? I suspect that's where you want to be or you wouldn't be here today. So if you're tired and growing weary of trying to make your life work out your way, and when you get disappointed when things don't go your way, and you know when relationships don't go the way they planned, or your job don't go as planned, or, or even you don't do the things like you wish you would have done, and you get them disappointed, it's not time to walk away. It's time to walk to Jesus. It's time to do some radical obedience. And you know, a lot of times the things that we suffer in this life and the things that are out of our control, they're not a surprise to God. They're part of God's overall design to bring you where you need to be so that you can ultimately love Him more. And that's better. That's a better place to be. And so I want to tell you, just to fall into the arms of Jesus and simply empty yourself and rest in Him. Can you do that? <laughs> Let's do that. That's where we need to be. And you know, the Hebrews, they wanted to go back to where they were coming. Because a lot of times when we're following Jesus, He pushes us out of our comfort zones. It gets, we get uncomfortable, you know? I mean, there's a lot of things that make us uncomfortable. And so they wanted to go back under the old covenant, under the old covenant law, but that wasn't God's way. And that's what we do a lot of times. You know, many of us have decided to follow Jesus sometime in the past. But, you know, when life got tough and... And, and, and because we weren't diligent maybe in passionately working out our faith and building our relationship with Christ, a lot of times we want to revert back to what's comfortable to us. You know, we don't like something in the church. We don't like something about this that we feel like God called us to do. And somebody hurts our feelings and that kind of thing. We just want to quit. Trust me, I've done it. I've quit. It's not perfect. It's never better. It's always worse when you quit following Jesus. I'm just going to tell you. It's always worse. Just keep following Jesus. Because if you don't, it's going to get worse. Not better. I trust you. And that's what, in essence, I think, is what this writer of Hebrews is trying to help these new Christians, these Old Testament people who found Jesus, he's trying to help them understand that. And so, you know, you see, when you live your life apart from from Jesus, you essentially say to God, I don't like your way. I like my way. You know? And in and, and doing that, you're saying, I don't trust your way. And instead of living by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, you live by laws that you establish for yourself. And you place yourself under the burden of your own laws. <laughs> and they're not any better than living under the Old Testament law. And so that's why you can't find the peace you need. And that's why you can't get the comfort that you desire. And that's, and, and that's why you, you don't see the purpose in your life that you long for. But, you know, you're basically doing the same things these Hebrews were doing. And it's not getting better. And so today, I want to share with you a few reasons to come back to Jesus. Because He a better sacrifice. Because, you see, a lot of what we're doing, when we don't accept Jesus and, and His uh, His work by grace through faith, and all what we're saying is His sacrifice wasn't good enough. We want to go back and do it this way. And we want to make things happen. Our way. We don't want to lean on Jesus. But, but it, that's not right. Jesus is a better sacrifice. And so let's look at that. There's going to be four reasons today. I want to show you why Jesus is a better sacrifice. Number one, and basically, it's a comparison to the old sacrifices under the Old Testament system. But in our lives, it's, it's a comparison to anything that we put in place of Jesus as, as a sacrifice to try to make ourselves right with God. Okay? Number one is this. The sacrifice of Jesus 
was a predicted sacrifice. And so when I preach through these whole chapters, it's a big summary. There's a lot of stuff in here that a lot of detail, uh, but uh, you know, we're just not going to go into that, so we're going to hit some highs. But the Holy Spirit revealed in the Old Covenant that a better sacrifice was coming. You know, that, that's what God wanted us to understand. When we read these first ten verses, we see a description of the tabernacle used in the wilderness that the uh, Israelites and the Israelite priests used to offer these sacrifices uh, under the Old Covenant for worship. And, and, and so, but here's what we know. We know that this tabernacle and these Old Testament sacrifices, they were never God's plan to redeem mankind from sin. We know that. That wasn't God's plan. That one didn't fail, so He sent Jesus. Jesus was always the plan. And that's what we've got to understand. A lot of people misinterpret that. They say, oh, well, He established all this, and then the Israelites, they couldn't keep it, so He sent Jesus. No, His plan was always to send Jesus. We see that all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. And so the tabernacle was a prophecy. It was a foreshadowing. It was a picture of what Christ the Messiah would do when He came. So the sacrifice of Jesus is better than the Old Testament sacrifices because it was a predicted sacrifice. It was a predicted many, many times. But I'm just using the tabernacle as the prediction here because that's what the writer does here in our text. You see, the sacrifices made under the Old Covenant, we've talked about some of these things, but they were made in an earthly sanctuary. When we read this text, we see that... Uh, you know, they were made in this earthly sanctuary built by hands of men under the instructions given to them by God. And all these furnishings that were placed in there that are described right here, they predicted a pattern that would come to the work of the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. That's, what, that's what's going on here. And so I wanna, I've got an image for you. We've showed you an image in the past of the, uh, of the tabernacle a little bit. This is a blowed out section. And basically, the outer, the outer uh, square, it's not perfectly square, I guess that's a rectangle, is uh, what would be called the uh, court of the men. And so men were only allowed to go to this point. And uh, then in the smaller rectangle there in the first part is the holy place. And you see the lampstand, you see the table of showbread, and you see the altar of incense right there in that three things. And in that smallest section, that is the Holy of Holies. That's the most holy place. And in there, the only thing that's in there is the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant is um, inside the Ark of the Covenant are the uh, tablets of the law, the rod that Aaron carried that bedded, and a cup of manna. And those three items were in, inside there. And so those... Those uh, symbolize some things. I, I want to get into some of the symbolism, but, but not everything. But the text mentions the two most inner parts of the tabernacle when you read it. It, it talks about the first part and then behind the second curtain. And it talks about these things. And so when you go into this first part, into the holy place, there's this lampstand. And I just want to point out to you something about this lampstand. The lampstand reminded the people of God that God is their light. And it is only a representation that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So it's a picture of Jesus right there. And then you go on and you see that this table of showbread was in there. And uh, the, the table of presence, as sometimes it's called, there were 12 loaves of bread that were baked every week that were placed on this a table that represented each of the tribes of Israel. And this bread represented God's faithfulness to provide the sustenance for His people that they needed. And so it ultimately, ultimately then represents the Lord Jesus Christ who said in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. And so it was a reminder to them not only of God's sustenance physically, but God's sustenance and provision spiritually in the coming bread of life who would give them uh, what they needed to live forever apart from sin, right? And so then the golden altar that's just in front of the most holy place there is an altar of incense and, and it separated the holy place from the most holy place and right there was one of those curtains. 
Now that curtain was about 16 to 20 feet tall and about 3 feet thick. That's how big that curtain was. That wasn't a curtain. That was a wall, right? And that's, that's the one that ripped from top to bottom when Jesus, you know, made his sacrifice on Calvary's cross. Just a coincidence, it happened to tear right from top to bottom, right at the moment that Jesus died, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, there's where it was. And on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, what he would do, he would go to this altar. And that's what this altar was for, was for the Day of Atonement. And he would burn incense. And as the incense aroma arose and ascended upward, it represented the prayers of the people of Israel ascending to God. That's what it was. Because he had to offer prayers for himself and sacrifices for himself to forgive and forgive of his sins so he could do the same thing on behalf of the people of God. But ultimately, this is a picture of our great high priest, Jesus Christ, who forever intercedes in the presence of God on our behalf. That's what it represents. Okay. And so then we go through the curtain into the Holy of Holies where we see the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant, there's there's some dis, 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 uh, discrepancy about the size based on what a cubit is. Uh, but only the Ark is probably about three or four feet long, about a little over two feet high, and a little bit of, over two feet deep. And it was made out of wood, covered with gold. And like I said, the, 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 ten, the Ten Commandments and the Law and Tablets inside, the rod that budded, and the manna, and on top, these two cherub, uh, a, che a cherub on each side, wings outstretched, either touching or almost to the point of touching, looking down at the center of the mercy seat where the priest, the high priest, would come in and sprinkle the atonement lamb's blood on behalf of the nation of Israel for unintentional sins. All right? So that's that's what was all designed there. But, but listen, on the day of atonement, when the atoning lamb's blood was sprinkled over the mercy seat, the, that blood covered the law and the rod that budded and the man. But only, I want you to understand that it covered the law. I don't know if I covered those stuff really well. But, but it covered the law. And when God looked down, He couldn't see the law because of the blood. You know, it, there's a covenant. And so, you know, we've told you guys that, that the blood from the Old Testament covenant covered sin. But the blood of Jesus washes away our sin. It takes away our sin. There's a huge difference. And when Jesus came as our sacrifice, His blood was an offering in a man-made temple made with man's hands and created materials that were here on earth that were tainted by sin. He took His blood into a tabernacle in heaven we saw last week, into the very presence of God in a tabernacle made by God Himself. And so, and His blood didn't just cover our sins, it takes away our sins. So you can see His sacrifice is great. But it was predicted. That's what we're arguing here. And so um, when we look at this, we read in the next few verses there in verses 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 that we see that this place was inaccessible to people. We've talked about how only the holy, uh, the high priest could go into the holiest place and only once a year. But when those veils were torn, the, it, it was opened up to all people. For all time, you know, forever to have access to God, His very presence. And so, you see, all these things point to Christ. That's my point. All these things point to Christ. The sacrifice of Jesus uh, was predicted every time a priest made a sacrifice in the tabernacle. Everything pointed to Christ as our sacrifice. That's what I want to help you understand about this point. Now, yesterday, as we were driving up to Dollywood, I, I like to mess with people some, maybe y'all have noticed that, but I was messing with Christian a little bit. Like, now where do we turn and, and this and that? And uh, I've been to Dollywood before, so I pretty much knew the way. But uh, but when we started getting close, you know, I kept and she said, just watch for the signs. You know, there's signs, just watch for the signs. And so I was like, okay. But you know, we've got this navigation system, so I'm like, let's put it in, because you know, I won't follow it, you know, and it makes it easy, doesn't it? 
And also might make us dumb. I'm not going to sit here. But, but anyway, here's the, here's the point. The signs, they exist to help you get to where you want to go. Right? That's why they're there. You know, when, when, when you get to a sign, like if you go to Dollar, when you get to a sign that says Dollar, and some of them are pretty nice, you know. But when you get to the sign, you don't jump out of the car and take a picture and say, hey, we're here. Time to go home. No, you don't do that. That's crazy. Nobody would do that. I mean, what you do is you use the signs to help you to get something that's better, and that's to actually get to the park, a real place where there are real, real rides and really great shows and film games. I mean, that, that's, that's what you do. And in the same way, here's the thing. You don't settle for the things that point to Christ as our sacrifice. Don't settle for those things. You don't settle for the old covenant sacrifices. They were signs that pointed to Jesus. You don't settle for the law. The law pointed to the fact that we needed Jesus. You don't even settle for church because the church is not the destination. The church points you to Jesus. And that's where we need to be. You don't even settle for the empty tomb or the cross. They point you to Jesus. And folks, Jesus is better. And does so don't settle for the signs. <laughs> Take Jesus. He's what we need. And so that's what's going on here. All these things they predicted. Jesus is just down the road. Maybe we get him. He's back. It's a better sacrifice. Because it's predicted. A second reason he's a better sacrifice, sacrifice is because he was a perfect sacrifice. The fact that the sacrifice of Jesus is a perfect sacrifice. And so um, when we look at verse 11, let, let's, let's read 11 through 14 and, uh, and just kind of get familiar with it. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things, that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all in the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of devout persons with the ashes of a heifer, sanctifying for the purification of the flesh, how much more with the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Okay, so it's a, it's a better sacrifice. Because he's a perfect sacrifice. And so the first thing he talks about here, we've talked about it a little bit, is he, he was... The sacrifice was offered in a place built by God, not, not built by hands. And actually, I probably got ahead of myself. I kind of already hit that point. So, so when we move on, when we look at verses 12, 13, and 14, you know, here's the thing. We see these animal sacrifices being made, and there were a lot of ceremonial sacrifices and rituals and all these things. And, I mean, you can really spend your lifetime studying some of these things. But, but there were no animals under the Old Covenant that volunteered to be sacrificed in the tabernacle. Did you know that? None of them were walking up to the tabernacle and going, hey, me, me. No, no, I mean, that didn't happen. You know, they were raised by men uh, and families, and they were chosen. And they were supposed to choose the best they had to offer, right? And they didn't always do that. They got in trouble for that a few times. But but, um, but animals weren't lining up as tributes, you know. I mean, that just that wasn't happening. But, but here's the thing. But Jesus, this text says, Himself, he entered into the tabernacle by himself. He wasn't carried into the tabernacle like a priest would carry a lamb. He wasn't led, although the text says he was led like an animal to the slaughter. He really wasn't led in that sense because he volunteered himself. He came himself. This text says he entered himself. And so there is an analogy obviously to being led as a lamb because he was the lamb of God. And he wasn't led by any priest. He was the high priest. You know, I mean, in his offering. He offered himself. Jesus is the greatest volunteer of all time. Amen? And so the animal sacrifices only covered our sin, but the blood of Jesus takes away our sin forever 
and gives us eternal redemption forever. And as perfect as the animals may have seemed, they weren't perfect. They all had blemishes. But, you know, they lived in a sinful world. They were raised by sinful men. They were tainted with sin. But Jesus was perfect. The Bible says He was without any blemish, any spot. And so He was a perfect sacrifice. Um, because of these things, when Jesus offered Himself, He offered a perfect sacrifice. And that makes His sacrifice better. Now, the other day I was looking for a shirt to wear. <clears throat> I found a couple of shirts that had been washed. But the colors, hey, I'm a sloppy eater sometimes. And, and uh, you know, uh, I have a tendency to drop stuff like right in here, you know. And um, so the shirts were supposed to be clean. But when I got them out, one of them was white, you know. So, I mean, that makes it even harder. But, but uh, I could see some spots. So I was like, I'm not ever get to wear that one again, you know. I mean, that's, that's my first thought, uh, you know. Or maybe have to dye it gray, you know. Uh, but uh, but anyway, <coughs> you know, that's just not the image I want to project. You know, I mean, the greasy spots. But uh, anyway, so um, I just lay on my side, you know, because somebody wants to wear a shirt with spots. I mean, not greasy spots, mustard spots, whatever, you know. But you know, that is what we get. With any sacrifice apart from Christ. Stains, blemishes, spots, tainted sacrifices. But when you accept Christ, you receive a perfect sacrifice. Completely pure. Completely pure. Without any blemish of any kind that appeases the wrath of God forever for your sin and gives you eternal access into the very presence of Almighty God. Perfect sacrifice is better. Amen? Another reason Jesus' sacrifice is better, not only was it predicted and perfect, but it was a providential sacrifice. And we've already hit all around this, but I want us to look at verses 15 through 22. Let's read it quickly. Therefore, He is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where our will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you, in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels and in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. See, the better sacrifice of Jesus provides an eternal inheritance and full forgiveness of sins. A full inheritance. So, that's what we're talking about. We talk about a providential sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus provided us with everything we need forever. You can't get any more providential than that. You know, I mean, you can't, you can't provide any more than that. You know, the blessings of the old covenant we, we've talked about a little bit uh, were dependent upon the obedience of God's people. You know, it was an obey and be blessed, and disobey and you're cursed, basically, right? And, but, but, but everything we receive through the new covenant in, in Christ is forever. It's eternal. It's, it's eternal blessing. And so in verse 15, we see through the language here in these verses, it's based on the covenant. But it carries, the covenant carries this idea of a last will and testament. I'm sure you picked up on that while we were reading. You see, when a person writes a will, it doesn't go in effect until they die. And, and so... This 
is basically saying that it was necessary for Jesus to die so the terms of the new covenant could be enforced, you know, inaugurated and begin. And so the old covenant, the, the text says, was made possible by blood. And so it wasn't just that it had to be death, but it had to be death through bloodshed because blood is required for the forgiveness of sins, the text says. And, and so the old covenant was like that, and the new covenant was inaugurated with the blood of Jesus. And the blood made the entry into the presence of God possible. That's what made going into the presence of God possible. That's why when they sprinkled it on the mercy seat, it covered the law. God didn't see the law. All he saw was the blood. He sees the sacrifice. And the access into his presence then is possible. That's all the representation here, the picture. And through the blood of Jesus, God has not only provided that for a year till the next day of atonement, he's provided that forever. Right? And so we, we need to understand that. And so ultimately the blood of Jesus provides us access to God forever with all the benefits that God has to offer us for all eternity. Isn't that awesome? Think about it. Oh, and what God has prepared for us, no man has seen or can even conceive of all that He has for us. Oh, it's going to be good. I mean, I'm just telling you. But there's a, there's a process. You know, there has to be the shedding of blood. There has to be this cleansing. There has to be this application of blood. These things have to happen. And so, you know, when Christie's mopping the kitchen floor, now this is a warning to y'all, so y'all listen up, all right? You pay attention because if she's been mopping the floor, you must, and I mean must, take your shoes off if you're going to do that. I mean, it's just no question that. And so, you know, if I'm outside working and uh, I need a glass of cold water to refresh me, you know, if I'm going to come in the kitchen door, I take the shoes off, you know, or face the consequences, right? I mean, uh, and so, um, I've got to take my shoes off. And only then am I allowed to enter the presence of this wet floor where the cup is, where the ice is, and where the water is, right? And once I've removed, removed my, my shoes, I can go in there and I can stay as long as I want.
So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not only to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for Him. There's a lot of good stuff in these last few verses. I wish I had more time. But, uh, you know, in the Old Covenant, we had these repeated sacrifices. You know, year after year, uh, month after month, week after week, day after day. And uh, in the Old Covenant, we see the blood of others offered. But, uh, but in the New Covenant, Jesus offered His own blood. And He didn't have repeated sacrifices. In the Old Covenant, the, the blood only covered sin. In the New Covenant, sin is put away with. In the Old Covenant, sacrifices were for the nation of Israel only. But in the New Covenant, the sacrifice is for all people of all nations of all time. And the Old Covenant uh, offered sacrifices in the Holy of Holies. But the New Covenant, the sacrifice was offered in heaven forever. And in the Old Covenant, God's presence came out to bless the people. But in the New Covenant, God will come to take His people to be where He is forever. Amen? Now you tell me, which one is better? It's no contest. It's like the New England Patriots playing the Sweetwater Grasshoppers. I mean, it ain't close. You know, it's not even ever going to happen. You know, the sacrifice of Christ is a completed work. It is final. It is eternal. And it's permanent. The word appear appears three times in these final verses of chapter 9. Jesus appeared to put away sin by dying on the cross in verse 26. He appears now in heaven making intercession on our behalf to God in verse 24. And then it says that He will appear sometime soon in verse 28 to take all those who were His home to be with Him forever. Three tenses of salvation. Past, present, and future. And they're all based on the finished, permanent work of Christ. How many of you all have a tent? Anybody got a tent? I got a few people. Some of you got a little bitty one. Over there. <laughs> but what do you use a tent for? Why do you have a tent? You go camp, right? I mean, you go out and it's a temporary dwelling place. It's a place to keep you out of the rain, keep you dry, you know, try to keep the critters off of you while you're trying to rest. But it's a temporary residence. It's something to be used to provide you a place to stay for a short time. It's not a per How many of you want a tent for, for your permanent home? Is that your dream? You want to, I want to keep it like a bigger tent. <laughs> Maybe, maybe when you live in the Middle East. I mean, they probably got some pretty nice tents over there. But, 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 uh, but, you know, but it's, but it's not a permanent home. You know what I mean? You wouldn't even consider that. You know what I mean? It's just not. And here, neither should you consider basing your relationship with God on any Old Testament ceremony that only meant to be temporary. Place your faith and life in the hands of Jesus and His sacrifice because it's permanent. It's permanent. He has gone to prepare a permanent place for you. Jesus said this in John 14, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Uh, he says this. He says, let, don't let your hearts be troubled. He said, you believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Now that's a good translation. Now, I know a lot of places it translates it. In my Father's place are many mansions, but it basically, the idea in Israel is a one big house. A lot of rooms. That's not, that's how they live, and that, that's that's a good translation. And he said, and so not only it's not like we're going to have a mansion for ourselves, but we're going to live in the home of God. You see, that's better. Isn't it? I mean, I think it's better. I think about it. You know, we're His children, but he says, you know, "My Father's house in many rooms. And if it were not told, were not so, I would have told you." And he says, "But I'm going away a way to prepare a place for you. And if I go away to prepare a place for you, I will come again." will take you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now if you want to be where Jesus is, you got to go His way. And on down this passage, and He says, I am the way. The truth and the life. He says, no man comes to the Father except through me. 
Jesus is the way. See, you'll never find that sense. The presence of God in His house for all eternity in the whole covenant. You'll never find access to God and all He has to offer through your plans for your life. Doing things your way, that's not God's way. You're not going to find access to God your way. Jesus is the way. you never find access to God through your actions, the things you do or don't do. You won't find it through your pedigree. You know, it's not there. You'll never find access to God through anything apart. From Jesus. His predicted sacrifice, his perfect sacrifice, his providential sacrifice, his permanent sacrifice. So this morning, as we prepare for the time of response, I just want to ask you something. You want something better? You need Jesus. Are you satisfied with you this morning? Are you satisfied with who you are? Are you? Who Christ has called you to be? Who He created you to be? Are you okay with who you are? With what you've done in this life for God's glory? Or are you weary? Maybe you're broken. Maybe you're struggling today. Are you at a place where you know you're separated from God? Listen. Sin will separate you from God. And even when you're a follower of Christ, it, it, it clouds that relationship. And it, 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 it leads you away from, from following Him and, and in His presence. You may still be a child of God, but if you're not following Jesus, it's going to mess you up. You want what's better? Follow Jesus. Follow Him. You know, just trust Him. It, it may be hard to follow Him. He may be asking you to do stuff you're afraid to do. He may be uh, asking you to be far more courageous than you ever thought you could be. Jesus made a way for you to have the comfort you need, the safety you need, the peace you need, the forgiveness you need, the love you need through His sacrifice. He made a way for you to have those things. He's made a way for you to have peace and purpose and fulfillment and hope. If you want those things, you'll find those things in the better sacrifice of Jesus. Let's bow our